Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It is July 22nd, 2016, and here's a look at our top stories. Tonight, manhunt in Munich. A shooting at a shopping mall has left eight people dead and multiple people injured. Meanwhile, the suspects remain at large. Then, the water supply in a small town in Colorado was found tainted with THC, the main chemical in marijuana. And there are signs that someone may have deliberately put it there. Plus, an ass-kicking constitutional lawman is taking on criminals in our government. So you get this politically correct you know, crap from the world about, you know, please don't hurt anybody's feelings, you know, while they're shooting families in the head. You know, this is, this is, this is the nature of the country we live in now, and I just don't participate. All that plus more from the RNC up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. This week, we've seen no shortage of craziness at the RNC, but next week at the DNC, there may be craziness for a different reason. And we see WikiLeaks releases nearly 20,000 hacked DNC emails. And it's unclear how WikiLeaks obtained the records, but the release comes weeks after a hacker or hackers going by the name Guccifer 2.0 began releasing records obtained through the DNC's computer system. Hackers claim to be Romanian, but many suspect the records were taken by a team of Russian hackers. The DNC, which is chaired by Florida Rep Debbie Schultz, has acknowledged their systems were infiltrated. The party has not commented on specific information released through the hack. According to WikiLeaks, which is operated by Julian Assange. The release is part one of a new series. It's calling the Hillary Leaks. So uh, it seems like things are just not going too well for Mrs. Clinton. Granted, she you know, stole the nomination from Bernie Sanders, but other than that, uh, she has a lot of things she's going to have to contend with. And this is just one of the things that's happening at the DNC. There's be a whole bunch of uh, shenanigans going on out there. Um, I heard that at one point they're going to have a fart in, a quote, fart in. Uh, Bernie Sanders supporters were going to go eat a bunch of pork and beans and and broccoli and everything else and go fart in the DNC. I, it, I'm glad I'm not going. I'll just leave it at that. So and that's one of the things that you can expect to see when it comes to DNC. And speaking of Hillary, remember that tomorrow, Saturday from 12 to 2, if you're in the city of Miami, Florida, you can head down to Florida National University Arena and you can see the Hillary for Prison banners flying around high in the sky. So be sure to take your pictures, bring your Hillary for Prison t-shirts, you get those autographs, we'll send you uh, a little something, something for that. And you can send all your pictures to writers at Infowars.com. Also, you can send us your pics on Twitter. And as we're talking about Hillary, let's talk about her VP choice. Because earlier this week, we got the news that Mike Pence was going to be the VP for Donald J. Trump. And now there's a lot of speculation of who Hillary is going to be, uh, choose to be her, uh, her sidekick, so to speak, in that VP spot. And they say sources are saying that it's Senator Tim Kaine, and he is the likely choice. They say uh, sources told Fox News that uh, Kane was the front runner. They have others considered for the position, also including Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack in New Jersey, Senator Cory Booker. They say he's a late entry, which is somewhat surprising. A lot of people speculated that it was going to be Bernie Sanders, possibly Joe Biden. Um, I thought it was going to be Sanders, to be quite honest with you, because after all the things that happened to him, I thought they at least, you know, dangle him the carrot. Hey, come help us tow the party line. But I guess he got his 30 pieces of silver. And, and I just love the memes with Bernie Sanders because he was supposed to be the different one. He wasn't like all these other politicians. He's going to bust up the big banks. Now he's supporting the woman supported by the big banks. And it's all uh, just gone downhill. But a lot of people say that Bernie really wasn't in it to win it. He was just trying to push the agenda so far left that he could get some of his policies through. And he has achieved that. that there are definitely talking points that Hillary will have to adopt to uh, get that Sanders base on her, on her ticket and not go to Trump or just not sit the election out. So in that regard, I think Bernie Sanders was successful, but uh, the Democratic Party in general is just not anything I want to deal with. Uh, that also includes the Republican Party. And to an extent, a, a libertarian ticket. Uh, I think the libertarians capable of doing a lot of good things, but they haven't really done it this election cycle. They got guys, you know, running around in thongs at the conventions. It's, I don't know what's going on with the Libertarian Party, but that's just one aspect of it. Now, as we talk about Hillary, they say that pretty much any criticism of Hillary Clinton is considered a war against women and attack on women, which is very interesting. I'd like to stay on this for one second because before Obama, you know, you watch the late night shows, the talk shows, uh, the stand-up comedians, 
they always made fun of presidents. It was nothing new about it going back. Even before we had TV and you know the, the modern conveniences, you had jesters making fun of the kings and the queens and all this stuff going back for centuries. But you know, once you get Obama in office, now you can't make fun of the president. Or if you do, it has to be like you know Jimmy Kimmel, where he's in on the joke and it's all funny, funny, ha ha. He's laughing at himself to an extent, not somebody making fun of him. Uh, but that has changed since Obama, where you can't criticize him if you do any type of criticism of the president, even a very joking manner. Uh, you're a bigot, you're a racist, uh, if Hillary gets elected, you're going to be a sexist, on and on and on. So the paradigm has completely shifted in what we would normally consider to be the war on race or religion or sex or anything to that nature. And now as I'm talking about a war on women, let's talk about a real war on women that's going unreported right now. And that's Russia's worst ever sex trafficker targeted 90 women, including a girl aged 10. And he treated himself to a victim every birthday in a 41-year reign of terror. He has become known as the birthday rapist. He's a 69-year-old, and he raped women in Moscow and is expected to die in prison. And it was dubbed one of the most complex cases in Russian history. And they had to uh, go under suspicion with over 20,000 men. They said eventually DNA linked them to the suspect. And he is a divorced father of one. He crept up behind his victims and choked them. And police are also probing claims that the pensioner carried out three murders. So you have stories like this. You have stories of the women getting raped with iron rods in, uh, in India, uh, women being arrested for driving in foreign countries. Uh, earlier this week, I believe it was a Pakistani woman who was murdered by her brother in an honor killing. You have all these real, true, legitimate wars on women. And here in the States, we're talking about whether or not women should be in the new Ghostbusters movie or not. And, th and that's... And to an extent, I heard somebody talk about this. If that's the worst thing that's going on in our country, as far as the public consciousness, there's plenty of real issues. But as far as pop culture and the public consciousness, if women being the Ghostbusters movie is the worst thing that's going on right now, we're, we live in a pretty good country, if that's our biggest concern. And I'm not saying it's good or bad that the women are in the movie. I'm saying this is what people are talking about. Like there is nothing else going on in the universe. So I haven't seen the movie. I, I don't know what the big hubbub is. If you don't want to watch the movie, don't watch the movie. Like. There's a new Lethal Weapon TV show coming out. I have no desire to watch it. There's a, a Rush Hour TV show that's made for CBS. You probably don't even know they did that. And I had no intention of watching that either. So they can remake whatever they want. I'm going to stick to the source material and everything else and go fly a kite. And flying kites to just being high as a kite, we see that a town's water supply has been spiked with THC. And this is in Colorado. And they say THC is the main chemical in marijuana. And there are signs that someone may have deliberately put it there. You think? Uh, everyone in the town of Hugo and on the Eastern Plains has been warned not to drink the water. I wonder how many people will heed that warning. It was a company performing a routine employee drug test that first alerted law enforcement to the problem on Thursday. Own, unknown levels of THC present, uh, present in Hugo's water supply. So uh, basically somebody spiked it with THC. How they did it, why they did it, I don't really know. But... In a state like Colorado, I guess it was just a matter of time before somebody uh, tried this type of deal. Uh, there's many different ways you can get high off THC or marijuana without drugging other people. If you choose to get high, get high yourself. Don't force it upon other people, whoever may have uh, pulled this. Uh, I don't know if stunt is the proper word for it. Now, somebody who's pulling a major stunt by coming after your Second Amendment rights. This is the AG in Massachusetts. And... Let's, let's stop for a second and think about this, because every time you hear these polls, right, you hear these polls, uh, you know, nine out of 10 Americans want X, or the majority of people said they want this. And when they say the majority of people polled, answered a certain question a certain way, that's fine. But when they try to say that's indicative of the United States of America, I don't really buy that. For example, where you poll has a great deal of impact on what your answers will be. Case in point. Uh, earlier this year, I was like, hey, where can I go and meet some Bernie Sanders supporters? So I went to the University of Texas and I did a man on the street. And lo and behold, I ran into a whole bunch of Bernie Sanders supporters. But I knew that Bernie Sanders was very popular with college kids. College kids are at the University of Texas. So let's go talk to the college kids and see who likes Bernie Sanders. <laughs> exactly my point. If you go to a very conservative steakhouse back in the sticks somewhere, you may find some guys who love Trump. If you go to the, to the gun show. Uh, you're going to find guys who are supportive of the Second Amendment. If you go to the, you know, uh, anti, you know, moms hate everything rallies, you're going to find people who don't want guns. So you're polling 
position, your polling location has a lot to do with the effects of your poll. So I never really believe these people when they say Americans want this and Americans want that. I'm like, no, the people that you asked, if you didn't ask them a leading question, answered because you asked them uh, a certain demographic. But all that to say this, when they say everybody wants to ban your guns or everybody wants to uh, get rid of the, uh, quote, assault weapons or uh, these military style weapons, I don't believe that because right here we have a case in point. This is the Massachusetts Attorney General. She came cracking down on the semi-automatic rifles and they sold a whopping 2,549 rifles in a single day. To put that in perspective, on a normal day in, uh, in Massachusetts State, they may sell 132 like they did on Tuesday or 51 rifles like they did on Monday. But the day the Attorney General came out and said she wants to crack down, they sold 2,000. 549 rifles with about eight hours notice. And they say that uh, she was trying to ban the quote copycat rifles that she felt violated the spirit of the 1998 Massachusetts assault weapons ban. But the problem is that Healy, the AG, inadvertently boosted sales of the very rifle she intended to prohibit as a rush on gun stores ensued. So this is what you have to remember. Every time you get, see Obama or you see Feinstein or you see uh, Hillary or anybody else, I want to ban AR-15s. People go out and buy the AR-15. I want to ban AK-47s. People want to go out and buy AK-47s. I want to have background checks to get ammo. People go out and buy ammo. And it's not that all these people are planning a mass shooting. They just understand that the government can't be there to protect you all the time. I love that, um, that interview. What's the guy's name? Kurt Russell, the cowboy. He plays all those, those cowboys. And he's talking to the guy. He's like, and the guy's like, man, we need to ban these guns. He's like, why do you want to ban guns? He's like, well, we have all these shootings. He's like, yeah, in countries where they have stricter gun control laws, uh, people make suicide bombs. Or they attack people with axes on trains. Or they get in a big semi-truck and they drive on the sidewalk and they run over 200 people. So it, it, it's not the firearm doing these things. It's the personal mentality. You can take away the guns and people are just going to drive trucks on the street. Hell, they do it here and we have uh, plenty of guns here. They did it right here in the city of Austin, Texas. I went to the uh, press conference the next day myself, South by Southwest. Uh, but I understand it was an individual who did these things. It didn't matter what weapon he had. If you have the ill intent, you're going to act on that ill intent, regardless of uh, the, the weapon that you may be carrying. Now, let's talk about something else. Now, when I speak about this next story, it's not so much that I love and care about Fox News. I'm not defending uh, Roger Ailes. I'm not uh, backing up the story of the, uh, the accusers because I don't really know. I don't work at Fox News. I have no desire to work at Fox News. But as we see, uh, Roger Ailes, he has resigned as the CEO of Fox News. And really, this is a, a testament to the changing media, how the media landscape is going to continue uh, to become something that's not this central, located uh, mainstream media as we know it today. It says the founder and chief executive officer of Fox News has resigned from his position under fire, but he will remain with the company until 2018 as a consultant. And the resignation marks a sudden and swift end of a 20-year reign of one of the media's most powerful moguls, a man who micromanaged talent acquisition at Fox, shaped its conservative viewpoint, and turned it into a ratings giant. And like I said, he did this because of uh, allegations of sexual mis misconduct. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. That's not the point I'm making here. I'm saying is the media is changing. And I was reading uh, Noam Chomsky's book last night, at least called Media Manipulation. I was flipping through it. And he was talking about the way the media controls you and how they manipulate you, how they put the propaganda out there. And a great example of this, and this is long before Ailes, I'm just tying it all together. Uh, the phrase support our troops, right? You have this phrase, you just put it on the bumper stickers and you say it at the football games and at the, at the soccer games, the basketball games, you have the, the commercials and all this stuff, support our troops, support our troops. And then people get it in their mind that, hey, my dad is a troop or my neighbor or my friend I went to high school with is a troop, so I want to support the troops, and I support the troops. I just don't support every single order that they're given, and that's how they they uh, put this thing together, right? They try to make it where you can't separate the troops from the orders that they're given. They're one and the same, so you have to support the troops, so you have to support every order that they're given. You have to support the troops when they, uh, they use a drone to blow up a wedding party. You have to support the troops, or they use a jet to blow up a hospital overseas. You have to support the troops, or you have to support the, the feds when they give guns to Mexican drug cartels, or you have to support the guys who airdrop grenades and rocket launchers to ISIS, they're, they're, they're one and the same now. So you have this mixed up blended thing that cannot be separated, and that's how they continue to push through these agendas 
with their media manipulation, doing things like that. He goes way more in depth, but I think that's a great example. I actually would recommend that book to a lot of people who are interested in getting into media so they can understand truly how the media operates. And now I bring you some very unfortunate news. It's another day and unfortunately a, another terror attack. And we have a manhunt in Munich after a shooting kills at least eight. A shooting at a shopping mall in Munich has left at least eight people dead and multiple people injured, the Munich police say. Police said that based on witness testimony, they were acting on the assumption that there were at least three attackers. They say they're describing it as an active shooting scene, and it's not clear what motivated the attack. And of course, uh, when you don't know who your shooters are, you don't know what their motivation is. Uh, it's a very scary thing, especially when you think about, uh, you know, you just go to a shopping mall, you're trying to live a, a normal everyday life, and then you have to deal with stuff there or any place you go, you go to school, any place else. But also, uh, this follows the not so recent axe attack that we saw earlier this week. You know, some guy was on the train, he had his axe, he had a knife, you know, he's fighting with people, you know, chopped people up, eventually the cops caught him and shot him. But, uh, man, it's, it's just getting to the point where this is not just here in the U.S., because they always want to talk about here in the U.S., and of course we have our issues here, but you also have things going on in France and in uh, Istanbul or in Germany, as we see in the case here, and we'll bring you more information as it becomes available. And finally tonight, talking about Mrs. Clinton. Now, if you don't like Mrs. Clinton, you don't wanna see Hillary for president, you may say you wanna see Hillary for prison, and that's exactly what you can participate in if you go to Florida National University tomorrow, and the hours are from 12 to two. There's gonna be flying around the Hillary for prison banners and just let her know uh, that she needs to be in prison. Also, I think it's still the uh, the bounty to call it out. If you can get Hillary to autograph your shirt, myself and Rob Dew will both send you $100 each. So uh, go out there, go forth and prosper. That's it for this segment. Stay tuned after this break for more special reports. Hey, is that Charlie Rose? Hey, hey. man, Alex oh. Jones. Hey, Alex Jones. Can you How spend are you? two minutes with us? Yes. Two well, minutes. I tell you, man, I tell you, you have, uh, I love your roundtable discussions. Yeah, thank you. Those are so original. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, are, quite, it's fun to do it. Do you think Trump's going to win? I have no idea. What's your gut tell? You're a smart guy. Well, my gut tells me it, that he could make it into a very competitive race. How do you do two, three shows a day? I know you're one of the hardest working guys in, in radio and TV. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> hey, I love it. I'm passionate about it. I take care of myself. I get several naps a day. I stay in shape. You know, I love the work and it overlaps. Look, I would interview Peter Thiel if you. I don't think people that go to Bilderberg are bad overall. I think some of the secret agendas and the shadow government are bad. Have you been to Bilderberg? Yes. And and was it not I mean, in a while though? Not in yeah. a while. So, I mean, is it overblown? I think so. <laughs> Do you think it's just kind of something left over from kind of the cold? Well, I, I don't. So I don't know. Well, Hello. Like, you talking about Bilderberg? It's no big deal. Uh, no. I mean, he's a he's a big media guy. We love talking to him. Yeah. Look at this big crowd here. Your fans. Uh, well, listen. Who are you supporting for president? I mean, first of all, I don't go out talking about who, who I support to you or to anyone else. You know, I'm registered as an independent. Let me ask you this question. What do you think about U.S.-Russian relations? Depends on who you talk to, doesn't it? You talk to John Kerry. He's trying to get them to do something together. You, you talk to other people. They, they're worried uh, about what's going on in, in Syria, and they're worried about Putin. So exactly. Why isn't it more congruent? Because usually in U.S. policy, you'd hear kind of a policy. It seems like there's a bunch of different policies. Well, I mean, you know, the administration is trying to have a relationship, uh, apparent to me, they're trying to have a relationship with Syria, in, or with Russia, in order to do something about Syria. They need Russia in terms of, because of the relationship with Assad, and Assad's gained some because of the Russian presence is stronger. You know, those 51 diplomats were complaining about U.S. not having enough leverage. Well, thanks for the time. I appreciate it. I like your style. Hey, well, I appreciate it. I'm being too scared to talk to us. Most people would be. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Now, he was not a coward. He talked to us, and I appreciate that, even though his staff freaked out like Drought Dracula just attacked. But, uh, yeah, yeah, so we're nice. People are nice to us. All right, there you go. Infowars.com. I'm Margaret Hell reporting for Infowars.com. I'm in downtown Cleveland taking a look at the mass protest underway. I want to talk to these guys over here, find out what they're doing here. Okay. Just don't. Don't. Do you guys want to talk to us? Get out of here with your crap. Just don't. Why are you guys here? I'm not here with them. I'm not here with anybody. Go. Look at this. Hey. What are you guys doing here? Get the f out of here. He doesn't want it. I'm not talking. We've got profanity. That's what we've got. 
Say that. Get out of here. I'm not hey, this is a public that. space. This is a public me. space. That sounds like a no. There are kids here and they're cussing, profanity. Who are you funded by? I'm not funded by anybody. I said get the f out of here, mate. Hey, bro, this is a public space. I'm not getting the f out of here. I'm not talking to you then, mate. I'm talking to you. No, no, I don't want to talk to you. I don't give a they want to talk to you. Get the camera out of here. No, no, no. Seriously, they just said they didn't want to talk. What do you do? We just want to know who they are and who they're with. There's no one. Just don't. Hey, look at you. Hey, look, all I'm trying to do is that, like, people, this place is. We just want to know who they're with. That's all. Like, what their what their platform is. I don't want to talk to them because they have masks on. It's fine. No, we don't. I'm interested in the flag, frankly. You know, kid, I don't think they want to talk to us, but no. honestly, listening to their grievances, I'm trying to figure out who they are, what they're with. Very hostile, very profane group, and just got cussed out for just wanting to ask them a simple question, what they're doing here. I heard them tell the police officers that they don't feel safe, that these guys don't feel safe, the guys with the masks on. No, that doesn't mean to anybody. Those people don't know what that flag represents, bro. Okay, so it's what, 430 people? 30 people only know what the flag is. Until I get a probably not a group, I don't know. They can go on YouTube and hit millions of people, but they don't even hear that. Seriously. They can park, talk amongst themselves, so I don't think 30 people only know what the flag is. In this place called Public Square. Listen. Okay. Listen. Anti Antifa is an organization that is on the streets every single day trying to go to war with fascists, KKK members, people that are on the street inciting violence against minorities, against Muslims, against blacks, against Jewish people. Everybody in this country that is marginalized, the KKK is out here. We saw what happened in Sacramento. We saw people go- I appreciate you talking to us. We're just trying to figure out who they are. They're afraid because they're targeted by the state. They're targeted by other racist groups and- that's We're targeted by the state and racist groups. Like which ones? Like, I mean, Racist groups like the KKK. The, them? Yes. Are you kidding? You guys, you guys don't see it because you're not on the street level. But there's like shit going on that you. I'm don't on the street every day. I'm sure. It's getting pretty hostile here. There's a fight that's about to break out. I think we should move for our own safety. Hey, just keep talking. You know, we're trying to figure out what the what the heck they want, what they're doing here. They said that they were targeted by racist groups, which is why they have to cover their faces. I'm not really sure which racist group they're talking about. Hey, Joe, did you catch the people in the mask? What's going on? They wouldn't talk to us. They they actually bumped us away. Yeah, that's what they always do. They want attention. This one's going to be the new meme, though. She's in the new Trigley Plus. That's they're asking for the audience. <laughs> <laughs>the rally was a huge success in defiance of those that wanted to censor our free speech and who tried to intimidate people from speaking. It's part of a systematic program we've seen of censorship, not, not just in cyberspace, uh, but physically on the ground. Uh, Obama had our airplanes that were towing banners the last few days banned and had the biggest restriction on airspace in the history of a convention done for the full convention here in Philadelphia in direct response to our legal and lawful uh, company. Uh, flying around with Hillary for president 2016. What do you think about the rally? I mean, was it a success, uh, Roger? Yeah, I think it was a massive success. Look, this was the suppression. They want to suppress our free speech because it endangers them. The truth is what they fear, and they know we're carrying the truth. So as Alex said, it's not just Facebook. It's not just Twitter. It's not just uh, cyberspace. But in the, in the villages and towns and communities, they want to suppress our ability to tell the truth. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, particularly grateful for, to the ACLU, who represented us in court, uh, and to the federal judge who had the courage uh, in a corrupted system to strike down the gag order of the Democratic machine of Cleveland and to order the city to give us a permit so that we could have our rally. Now, the Westboro Baptist Church had no trouble getting a permit because they thought that would embarrass us. And they and Black Lives Matter had no problem getting a permit and, and uh, 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 Move On had no problem getting a permit. It was only uh, liberty-minded Americans who want to protest, or I should say celebrate, in this case, the nomination of the Trump-Pence ticket. So this was a terrific victory in the federal courts. It was a terrific public relations victory. As long as Jones and Stone are breathing, free speech and the truth will not be suppressed. And that's another important question. I'll get to some of you guys' questions, but, but let me ask you this. Trump clearly is starting to come ahead of Hillary in many polls, battleground states. We've already talked about that. How will they strike back? What do you expect him to do at the end of this convention 
when I know you told me you expect Trump to be even more ahead. Yeah, I think the, I think Trump takes the lead in this race after the convention. Uh, I have enormous faith in Paul Manafort and Tony Fabrizio and Jason Miller. These guys are political pros. They have bonded with Trump. We now have a cohesive campaign in which everybody's pulling in the same direction. And I'm absolutely convinced in Mike Pence we have the best possible running mate of the choices available and that he is going to be a perfect balance for Trump out in the Republican states and in the base states. So, yes, what I think happens here is that Trump, the Trump Pence ticket is going to pull ahead. That's in the face of an unfair mainstream media that spends all day trashing the Trump Pence ticket. It's in the face of a country where there are more Democrats than Republicans. You know what you're going to see from the Clintons? Panic. And that's when they try to bring down the police state. That's when they try to shut down your rallies and they start playing games with the voting process. The single most da biggest danger out there, I believe, is voter theft, is voter fraud. We saw it to, a, to a, some degree in the primaries. Uh, the machines are going to be working overtime, voting people who are dead, a great tradition in Texas, as you know. They're going to be voting people that don't exist. They're going to be, be voting people who are not qualified to vote. They're going to be voting people multiple times. That, I think, is the danger because the established order is petrified. Trump can't be bullied. He can't be bought. They see a wave of reform unlike anything they have ever seen. And they're scared shitless. Alex, what role do you think that you and Roger have played in the rise and success of Donald Trump this election cycle? I think we're all just together as populists and basically have 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 just been out promoting what we've been promoting for a long time, and Trump's just doing that as well. So I just see us all working together in synergy. Uh, but I have seen Roger particularly and myself and others, uh, Drudge, Matt Drudge of DrudgeReport.com, I guess a lot of the credit as well, to counter lies of the establishment media faster than Trump's people were doing earlier. Liam McAdoo with Infowars.com. We're here in Cleveland covering the Republican National Convention. I am seated next to Captain Clay Higgins. Now, you just got done uh, doing an interview with the Alex Jones Show, a really great interview. And now I wanted to get the chance to sit down, talk with you a little bit. Of course, you might recognize this guy from those viral Crime Stopper videos. You put your parish kind of on the map with that, able to really round up a lot of criminals with those viral videos. Um, tell us a little bit about that strategy. Well, you know, I, I threw away the script. That's my nature. When I, when I was asked to fulfill that duty position, I've been a street cop for now for 12, 13 years. And in November of 2014, my sheriff asked me to be his public information officer. A small part of that job was uh, performing the public service announcements are called uh, Crime Stoppers once a week. And, you know, my my nature is to speak candidly and from my heart. So I did so. I, you know, I would research the crime and, and then address the nature of the crime. What did it really mean about, you know, our, our country that, that such a thing could even happen? And, and uh, you know, the pain of the victim, the the uh, invasion of the, of the victim's home, uh, that these are not just numbers on a report. These are people. These are our fellow Americans who have been injured, hurt damaged in some way and I always addressed the you know the suspect as a as a, a fellow American fellow child of God you know failed and fallen yes but aren't we all in some way and uh, I believe in the redemptive nature of every human being so although I I expected to hold the suspect accountable for his actions I also believed in him as a man and and his ability to accept responsibility and move forward towards you know a redeemed life you know within his own soul and within his own heart and somehow i was able to communicate that through the camera and it, it did touch people's minds and hearts and souls and during the course of the time that i was uh, the public information officer for the sheriff uh, 19 19 felons 18 men and one woman presented themselves peacefully to the sheriff's office and turned themselves in. That's unprecedented. Um, and then when we did the Gremlins video, which was my final Crime Stoppers video, that's a, the, the one that, uh, that there was somewhat of an uproar and because I found myself principally opposed to, to, to the commands I was given by my sheriff, I had to resign as a matter of principle. I, sort of, I became sort of a conscientious objector, you understand? I'll follow any order, but if it's, but if it's contrary to my deep conscience, then of course I'm bound 
you know, by a higher law to, to, to step down, which I did. Since then, of the seven gremlins that were we were looking for, these were some hyper-violent guys, man. They were, they were out there doing wrong. Uh, since then, within a few weeks, three of them turned themselves in, and then over the course of the last eight months or so, uh, the other four have been captured. So, you know, yes, ma'am, we were very successful with the Crime Stoppers videos, and uh, but you know what? That door closed, and and uh, God opened another one. Yeah. So that's where I am now. Well, I actually saw that that Gremlins video. It was pretty badass. That was why I was like, we've got to get this guy on the show. That was so wonderful. But of course, you did talk a little tough in it, and some people. Some people were a little offended. They said that was a little too tough. How, how dare you speak to these hyper-violent criminals in a, in a derogatory way? How did you feel about that? Well, you know, you anticipate that. But, to, you know, street talk is tough talk. Mm -hmm. And it, if you're a street cop talking to street criminals, then you use street language. And that's just reality, man. You know, they, we, we live in a society now that's, that's, that's uh, you know, very protected shall we say, insulated from the from the horrors of the street, you know, by and large. And so so you get this politically correct, you know, crap from the world about, you know, please don't hurt anybody's feelings, you know, while they're shooting families in the head. You know, this is this is this is the nature of the country we live in now. I just don't participate in it. I, I will not participate in gossip. It's the cheapest form of human communication and I will not participate in political correctness because it's a it's a venom man it's a cancer that's destroying our country this is the we we live in the United States of America our first amendment guarantees our free speech it was this is our this is of course the foundation of our freedoms it's a cornerstone of who we are and what we are and yet we've allowed insidious forces to uh, to to impose upon us the restriction of our speech and the restriction of our emotions in some manner as if they're right and we're wrong. Well, listen, every one of my fellow Americans, regardless of ideology, color, creed, uh, political affiliation, social background, ethnicity, we all have earned the right that by the by the blood that's been shed by patriots that have by the heritage of our family, every single one of our families has woven the thread of our flag under you know we we stand in the shade of the glory of that one flag that's been woven by an entire nation of people of every in imaginable color and creed and we have the right to speak our mind right. so i'm just not participating in political correctness right. when i go to washington i'm not i'm not participating in that game up there either mm -hmm. they're gonna find out well, I, I, the, the nation is obviously ready for um, brave people to stand up and, and speak out like that. Um, now, speaking of tough talk, what did you think about Obama's response to all of these uh, fallen officers getting shot in the street in Obama's America? As a constitutionalist, I have deep respect for the position of commander in chief. You'll, you'll rarely find me saying a disparaging word in private or public about the man that holds that office. I was. I've been continually disappointed in the, the message and the, and the uh, rhetoric that has come out of, out of my White House because that White House doesn't belong to President Obama, nor did it belong to President Bush, nor any before them. It belongs to the American people and those in D.C. and the Beltway, the career politicians that have, that have seized power in Washington need to hear Lima Charlie that the people are about to take this country back. So you ask me how I feel about some of the things he said, ma'am, it would require me to say ugly things. And I'm just not going to say that about my president. He, I, I have been, to my heart and soul, very disappointed. And just at the time when he had such an opportunity for leadership, man, from his unique position as our, our first African-American president, he really, really could have made things better. But that certainly hasn't happened, has it? And obviously taking that opportunity to push for more gun control, where do you stand on that? Well, our Second Amendment clearly defines, you know, gun control. Listen, it wasn't even until the 60s that, that guns were regulated at all. In the 50s, a, a, a child, any child could buy a gun from any seller if daddy sent them with the money. It wasn't until the 60s we even had serial numbers mandated on, on guns. I grew up in the 70s, went to a large rural high school, every vehicle in the parking lot mostly on 
teachers and students side was a pickup truck and most every vehicle had a rifle or shotgun but in the back glass and nobody got shot you know the availability of guns in our country has been more restricted over the last several decades where you're starting to see these mass shootings and whatnot so you have to ask yourself what's going on man it's a breakdown of the family it's a breakdown of our culture and and personally i think it's our it's our national shame of how we address mental illness in our country. We have a history of failure in that. Now, I don't know of any country that handles it right. I'm just talking about America. And, and you know, you always look into the background of these mass shooters, and it, those are the guys pulling the triggers. And you look at their history, there's always some kind of mental, you know, challenge that they face that's been handled with uh, mostly with pharmaceutical drugs that Christ knows what's in that stuff. And, and I just don't think that that restriction of, of gun rights and ownership rights for, for guns or restriction of the type of guns that we have. We already have many, many restrictions. You know, we, we are certainly well regulated, are we not? Right. I mean, there's, people talk about military weapons. You know, American civilians can't own tanks and, and uh, can't, we can't own calibers over, over 50 caliber. You know, the, we in order to own an automatic weapon where by that I mean you pull the trigger one time and more than one bullet comes out you have to pay for a very expensive license it's, a, it's an extensive background check takes months and then you have to maintain that license which is expensive every year which is why very few Americans have that so we're already heavily restricted uh, the, the, the shootings that we're looking at right now are not because of guns it's because of the people holding them and perhaps and perhaps of a systematic failure in our nation to deal with mental illness. That's where I stand on that. Here we have Alex on Media Row at the RNC. Alex reaches the Young Turks YouTube booth and is instantly met by a group of disheartened, arrogant anchors harboring a clear loathing of all things Alex Jones. Uh, Alex Jones is right about a few things. Uh, so about the NSA spying, etc. cetera. Uh, he was right about that. We were right about that. Uh, the problem with Alex isn't what he starts out with. It's where he ends up, okay? He'll take some things that are true and then next thing you know, by the end of the conversation, the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds are killing everybody. What? <laughs> and then the lizard people take off their masks and they go, Whoa. And so there's some goodness to uh, Alex Jones, no question about it, and some th a lot of things that I appreciate. Uh, but we got, so one of our listeners sent us a clip where he's going ballistic, he's going crazy, right? How are you guys doing? Uh, yeah. We're doing okay. You like all our Hillary for prison shirts everywhere? No, I kind of despise it. <laughs> Young Turks anchor Jimmy Dore appears to announce the attack that is about to transpire. It's Alex Jones! Oh my God! Finally, Jank Uger, the main host of the Young Turks, loses it. Big note, oh, the Roger Stone's band. All right, you want to take show, my show over? I'll take your show sure, over. Go ahead. Okay, you know what? Who does this kind of shirt? First of all, sick guy. Second of all, Bill you know, a rapist, you, you, no, you, you, chaos you know ensues you know as Jank is triggered by a Bill Clinton you know T-shirt with the word rape, rape on it, and then the Young Turks host Donald proceeds J. to unleash his vitriol for all Trump things Roger Republican you know on Roger it's Stone. Court papers, oh, yeah. and you're a sick dude, Roger Stone. Well, you assault me all the time. You never give me a chance to respond. Yeah, oh, I should give you a hatchet job, a job to we'll respond. We'll you're a sick in. man, Roger Stone. Roger, no, you're the world's we'll biggest get him liar. Get him in you, didn't you admit that you lied about Elliot Smith, sir? Didn't you already admit that, you piece of crap? You piece of crap. And first of all, Alex, this ain't your show. Okay? And Roger, it surely ain't your show. Okay? Afraid? Are you kidding me? No, 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 no. Bring it back home. Bring it back home. Who the Cutting. Hey, Bring it back on! Right Anna Kasparian even blurts out fat-shaming insults at Alex as Alex is swarmed by the Young Turks crew. Paul Joseph Watson writes, Towards the end of the confrontation, Anna Kasparian is caught on tape yelling at Alex Jones, Get off the stage, you fat 
Aside from the fact that Jones is virtually the same size as Kasparian's boss Jank, her insult you, completely contradicts her previous conviction that Arabians people should not enough, be shamed God. over hey, their weight. I can relate to it big time um, because when I was uh, about four years old, my dance instructor told me that I was overweight. And as, as a four? Yes, and that stayed with me for the rest of my life. Now, I hope, I mean, I don't fit the, the results of the study. I, I'm not in an unhealthy body weight. At least I don't think I am. But, but you know, it, it does scar you and you have issues with food and eating for the rest of your life. First of all, let me explain something, all right? Okay, Guys, this is can you uh, okay, relax. hold on, hold on, hold on. We're against Saudi Arabia, you dumbass! We talk about that all the time! Oh, really? We talk about that all the time! Well, the you don't know who What do you think, the lizard people are in charge? No. Is that what you think? Hey, your pisses Bill were kicking your ass! Is that what you think? You're the anti-liberal and you're pissed. Bullsh**! Yeah, nice here. You, you know what I care about? I care, about? I care about hey, the American hey, people. Good. You're you're the one flipping out. Out. Anybody hurt? Come on, we're all doing Anybody hurt? I'm being nice. Young Turks anchor Jimmy Dore on the left takes a drink and like a frenzied llama proceeds to spit in Alex's face and then shrinks back into the fray giggling and celebrating his own lack of any semblance of manhood. This is big. Hey, come on. My stand. That guy just spit my face. Unbelievable. What a cowardly little bitch. Yeah, get the I'm asking you, did you spit his face? Did I see? Okay, fine. Immediately following the assault on Alex, within roughly 30 minutes, all uploaded videos following the Young Turks debacle on the Alex Jones YouTube channel were shut down. And then the Young Turks crew immediately went on the defensive, belittling Infowars and Alex Jones. So Alex Jones comes here. In the beginning, I wasn't mad at all. Okay, he's doing his grandstanding, and he's doing it because we have a much larger audience. So if he's containing his tiny, tiny audience, well, then he has more trouble reaching a broader uh, section of Americans. I cannot handle someone exploiting our show, capitalizing on our show, just to get eyeballs on him. That's why he's a pathetic show that he has to come on to larger shows to get this audience. This was Media Row at the RNC, hardly a controlled set at a media headquarters. The entire circus could have been avoided had the Young Turks crew had the equanimity and been even moderately professional and politely gotten to the bottom of and managed any misunderstanding. However, the Young Turks succeeded in a cowardly display of self-righteous, pretentious arrogance and avarice, so childish that once the dust settles, complete embarrassment is sure to find its way to their petty conscience. Or maybe not. You dumbass! We talk about that all the time. Oh, really? We talk about that. John Bowen for Infowars.com. What do you think? We're joined by a regular guest, although she hasn't been on for a while. Syrian girl who is a geopolitical analyst and contributor for the New Eastern Outlook, because of course we had this horrific video that came out a couple of days ago, which I actually watched in full. I wouldn't recommend anyone to do the same where this young boy was beheaded by this rebel group backed by the Obama administration. It looked like this would have consequences for the U.S.'s involvement in Syria, but whether that's true or not remains to be seen. Syrian girl, welcome to the show. Hi, I'm glad to be back here. It's been a while. It's been a while, but we've had this big news again in Syria this week. It's really uh, come back into focus. Before we get into the aftermath of, you know, how the media is twisting the narrative on this beheading, just walk us through this tragic sequence of events that led to the murder of this young boy in Aleppo. I, you know, commiserate with you because I also watched the horrifying video of this child getting beheaded and also laughed at by one of the CIA's moderate vetted rebels. And... Uh, the sequence goes really back to 2011 and 2012, when uh, many governments, not just the U.S. government, but also NATO European governments, including France, started openly arming rebel groups. Um, Hollande, you know, he, in 2012, openly said, yes, I'm arming these rebel groups in Syria. Um, the CIA, apparently, this particular group that did this beheading, um, was CIA trained 
And in March of 2015, the you know NATO-run media was complaining that Russia was bombing this group, CIA-trained, vetted, moderate rebel group. And the most interesting thing, you know, in these last three years is that uh, they've been telling us that there's moderates and there's terrorists. There's the moderate rebels that they're arming, which are vetted and very nice. And then there's the terrible, terrible ISIS and Al-Qaeda, which every single uh, massacre, though, of course, ISIS and Al-Qaeda commit numerous massacres and acts of terrorism, but every single one, you know, they're just waved off as acts of ISIS, but not protected moderates. Um, but now the moderates have proved to be worse than ISIS and Al-Qaeda. And in fact, in the newly uh, vid out video of the translation of the beheading, this moderate CIA trained group said, we are worse than ISIS. You should see how brutal we are. That was just before they beheaded the child. So, um, you know, it comes to now the point where uh, we can prove that the US State Department Obama and his whole administration, including Clinton, put guns and taxpayers' money in the arms of something that is worse than ISIS. So I wonder when is it there going to be some legal repercussions to that, not only because it's against the US law and is basically an act of treason, but also in the international law. Because of course, if you're going to uh, give weapons to terrorists, that is a crime. And that's it for our show tonight. We do encourage you to go to prisonplanet.tv and get yourself a free trial. You can see the nightly news, the special reports, the rants, all right there at prisonplanet.tv. Well, I'm Jakari Jackson from the InfoWars Command Center, and we'll see you again next week.